Hey guys, so uh, I had to unexpectedly miss school today uh, due to the death of my family that I discussed with you guys before. Um, so I uh, recorded this video uh, for us so that we can stay on track with chapter 9. So I'm going to try to keep it to a tight 40 minutes and here we go. All right, so uh, what we're going to pick up on the study guide, we are on the set, uh, the uh, the thing that says three main streams of Western migration. So when we talk about Western migration, uh, over 4 million Americans moved to uh, the, um, the uh, west of the Appalachian Mountains uh, by 18, uh, gosh, 1840, I think. Uh, 4.5 million west of the Appalachians by 1840. And we talked about that. They weren't mostly going by themselves. They're mostly going in groups. And we kind of categorize these three main groups uh, in what we call three streams of migration. So when we look at these streams of migration, um, we have, uh, I'm going to turn on the laser pointer. So I don't know if it's showing, it's not showing my laser pointer on the recording. Oh, too bad. Okay. So anyway, when we talk about the streams of migration, um, we've got uh, people coming from what is the, the South, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, Southern North Carolina, to the Deep South, the Cotton Kingdom, otherwise known as the Black Belt, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, um, Southern Tennessee, Missouri, uh, eventually Arkansas and Texas, once those are things. Uh, these are slave owners and their slaves, and more slaves, uh, as cotton became like the big thing. Uh, our second stream of migration, these are uh, independent, non-slave-owning farmers in the Upper South, that'd be Virginia and North Carolina, moving west to Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, uh, where there's more economic opportunity um, and less competition with large slave owners. Um, next, the third group we have are people leaving New England and New York, as well as kind of the New York area, like New Jersey and North uh, East Pennsylvania, going to the Northwest, to Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, um, Michigan. Uh, this last group, these are um, a lot of different kinds of people. You got middle class uh, urban, you know, urbanites, people living in the cities, middle class, who want to move out and have a big farm out in the West where land is cheap. Um, it's also uh, immigrants moving from, uh, who've recently arrived in uh, America, moving to the West, especially German immigrants. A lot of German immigrants moved to cities like Cincinnati and Milwaukee and Chicago, and there's still a lot of German ancestry there from that. So those are our three main streams of migration. The next topic it talked about was the cotton kingdom and slavery. So uh, the, uh, the cotton gin is invented in 1793, I believe. Uh, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. Eli Whitney was not a fan of slavery. He thought that the cotton gin would make the slavery obsolete, but instead it caused slavery to boom. With the invention of the cotton gin, a device for removing the seeds from American cotton, uh, cotton production booms to an all-time high and cotton becomes the most expensive commodity in the world. There's my map there. So you can see these dots. Each dot represents 2,000 bales of cotton produced in that, um, in that area. And so you can see how in um, 1820, cotton is still mostly being grown in the traditional South, South Carolina, Georgia, but it is now spread much further in 1840. Now, this map does not show cotton being grown in Texas because Texas was not yet a state. Uh, the Texas Republic, which grew from uh, both legal and illegal immigration to the Mexican province of Tejas in the 1820s and 1830s, uh, was built around slave-grown cotton. So Texas is actually going to be a major, major producer of cotton. It's just not showing on this map. That's important to note. Um, anyway, so that is uh, cotton. Uh, and, of course, we know that the cotton kingdom, cotton becomes um, a very integral part of the uh, market revolution because, you know, um, our uh, industrial boom in the 1840s 
is based around the production of cotton. Um, and, and, of course, along with this comes uh, slavery, right? Slavery is necessarily going to be increased by cotton production. Um, it's going to go hand in hand with it. And so there's going to become a new, um, a new industry for the Upper South is shipping slaves to the Lower South. Um, and this is going to be known as the Second Middle Passage. Your author doesn't use that term, though, until Chapter 11, for whatever reason. But we have this interesting picture here, seeing that a lot of these slaves um, are actually shipped uh, by just a forced foot march, uh, very reminiscent of the Trail of Tears, which is also actually in this same time period, not probably a coincidence. Anyway. So yeah, um, let's let's uh, let's move along. Uh, we'll talk briefly about commer Western commercial farming. Um, I don't really have a slide for that uh, exactly. Um, I don't think. Uh, I mean, you can see here's uh, a map just so we can look at kind of uh, kind of what we're uh, what we're talking about here when we talk about these areas. So uh, this uh, green represents a uh, higher population density, more than six inhabitants per square mile. And then you can see the cities, um, a square represents over 300,000. We see we only really have one of those at New York City at this point. Uh, the blue circle is um, between 50 and 299,000. So we have, you know, like uh, Baltimore and Philadelphia, Boston, uh, New Orleans, right? And then the yellow are cities of less than 50,000. So these Western cities like Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis, Cincinnati, Louisville, uh, they are still very much uh, in their infancy. Uh, but yeah, people are moving out to the West uh, where land is cheap uh, in order to um, have the uh, economic opportunities uh, presented by that cheap land. And so we see a lot of commercial farming, and then we see the boom of these big cities. Um, let's go ahead and move on from that. Let's talk about uh, artisans to factories. Sorry. Uh, let's talk about artisans and factories. So uh, a inevitable evolution of a capitalist economy is a movement away from an artisan system and toward a manufacturing system called a manufactory or factory system. Uh, and this this picture, I think, so perfectly illustrates the, the concept, right? So under an artisanal, artisanal system, right, you have skilled craftsmen called artisans, and they are their own masters. This gets to this concept we talked about back in Chapter 2 of the, the masterless men, right? These are men who are in charge of their own lives day to day, moment to moment, right? Uh, so you want a chair, you go to the artisan that makes ch the chair maker, right? Uh, and the chair maker shows you uh, drawings and sketches of different styles, and you pick what you want, you give him the order, and then he does it on his schedule. He works however many hours a day he wants to work, however many hours a week he wants to work. He does it in whatever order he wants to do it. And at the end, he produces a high-quality product that costs a lot of money because it took a lot of time and because only someone with his specific set of skills and training could even do it in the first place. And what the factory system does is it takes that one expensive skilled profession and it breaks it up into several unskilled jobs that literally anyone can do. And so a business person can take uh, this job, this one artisanal job, and they can break it up into, in this case, uh, six jobs, right? So instead of having one guy who knows how to make a chair and does it on his own, instead you have six workers. And this worker, all he has to be able to do is run a plane. He has to just run a, a plane, which is a tool, over a piece of wood to shape it in the right shape for the back of the chair, right? This guy, his only job is to paint. Right? All he has to do is paint the stain on and paint the detail on. This guy's only job is to weave the seat. This guy's only job is to hammer the legs into the frame. And this guy's only job is to operate the spinning lathe. And so all of these guys, none of them by themselves could make a chair most likely, right? 
but each of them can do that one specific part of the job and they can do it really quickly and you don't have to pay them very much money. And so while collectively these six guys might cost more to employ per day than the artisan makes when you break down his job per day, uh, they produce their product way faster than the artisan. So you're producing more product for not very much more money, if not less money, in fact. So anyway, this is an inevitable transition. Um, and uh, this kind of gets into, uh, if you, uh, I, on the study guide, we're going to skip textile boom. Um, we've already kind of talked about that, but I'll, I'll come back to it. Uh, life for industrial workers, right? So what is life like for industrial workers at this time? Uh, they're typically working between 10 and 12 hours a day, sometimes more than 12 hours a day. They're working six days a week. The weekend was not a thing for not for the working class. Uh, Sundays were off because of church, uh, because we're still a very religious country. But uh, yeah, they're working you know 12 plus hours a day, most likely at least 10. Um, they're being paid just really barely enough to pay their bills, um, to 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 pay rent and uh, and to pr and provide food for their family. Uh, there is no such thing as health insurance. That's not a thing. There's no such thing as retirement. There's no Social Security, anything like that. Uh, and conditions uh, tend to be hard uh, with uh, employers often uh, whipping employees, or sometimes whipping employees, uh, but treating them pretty harshly. Uh, they're working these 12-hour days with a, you know, usually just a break for lunch, and that's it. No restroom breaks, no smoke break, bathroom break, um, you know, meal, uh, uh, snack break, nothing like that. Uh, usually standing up the entire time, uh, not always, but usually standing up on their feet, uh, usually uh, silent or often si kept silent. So the conditions are very hard, very strangulating, and it's important to understand that this transition from the artisan to the manufactory is good for the economy. It causes businesses to boom and, and really helps manufacturing and it's a necessary key in key pro, uh, step in the evolution uh, to a capitalist economy. However, uh, it does destroy workplace autonomy. It destroys uh, essentially the freedom of the working class. So well, that's it. I don't have anything else to say to that. All right. So anyway, moving on. Uh, the next topic on our study guide. So we discussed um, the cotton boom, uh, so or the textile boom before. But uh, basically, when we're talking about the how the market revolution, uh, the country is intertwined, and you cannot escape slavery. Right. So slaves in the South are producing cotton. That cotton is being sold to factories in the North, where it is fueling our industrial revolution through a boom in textiles. This is actually really important because um, we talked about that the War of 1812 helps accelerate um, the market revolution, right? Uh, because for, we're cut off from British goods for like eight years between the embargo and then the war. Um, and the British are the world's number one manufacturing power, but their main export is textiles, cloth, cloth products, right? Um, mostly wool. but. Sorry, I keep pausing it because people are going down the hallway with these loud carts. So uh, anyway, so um, textiles, right? So uh, when we go without British goods for eight years, we're especially going without British textiles for eight years. Uh, this coincides with some corporate espionage by a guy named Samuel Slater, who um, sneaks out the blueprints for the British power loom, which is um, right there. That's the British power loom. Uh, and so he starts a factory in Lowell, Massachusetts with a business partner, Samuel Lowell. Um, and we get the Lowell girls. So uh, this brings us to Lowell and the mill girls. So uh, Lowell and his business partner, Slater, uh, they come up with a pretty ingenious economic system. Uh, their system is essentially rather than just employ regular working class people, they specifically hire only girls, teenage girls mostly, between the ages of 12 and eh, 22, 24, uh, but mostly younger, mostly you know 16 to 18. Um, 
And uh, the idea is uh, basically, you know, wi uh, women historically, you know, they're not supposed to be in the workplace, but they always are in the workplace, right? It's just they're not supposed to be, but they have to be because the working class doesn't have the luxury, air quotes, the luxury of those kind of rigid gender roles. You know, women, poor women always have to work, even if society tells them they're bad for doing so. Uh, but um, if a teenage girl leaves the farm and goes to work in the city, then the expectation is that she's basically becoming a prostitute. Uh, this ruins her reputation. It's going to make it very difficult for her family to find someone for her to marry. Uh, and it is dangerous. And many of them do end up on drugs or in prostitution. Uh, or some of them do. Uh, not many. I mean, not a lot, large percentage, but still a lot. Uh, and so the Lowell factory and the other textile factories that copy it, their solution to this is they hire these girls, uh, but specifically they vouch for them because what they do is they have them stay in dormitories with a dormitory mother and their behavior and morality is strictly, strictly monitored and vouched for. And so uh, essentially... Um, these girls can work, they can make money, they have the freedom of not being under their parents' watchful eyes, but their reputation and purity stay pure, right? And so then they can still get married um, off by their parents, uh, or if they don't want to, then they can go and do something else, right? But the point is, they have way more freedom than they would have at home, but they still are living in a very uh, boarding school-like uh, manner. Um, uh, they are, uh, they're, they're not smoking, they're not drinking, they're not carousing with men, uh, doing anything, you know, un, unladylike, right? Um, and they are, are living under a very strict schedule as well. Uh, this is, uh, from 1853. This is Holyoke Mill, um, in, uh, uh, Holyoke, Massachusetts, uh, and this shows you what their workday is like. This is six days a week. Morning bell, 4.40 a.m. So you get up at 4.40 a.m. Second bell, 5 a.m. You're expected to be at work by 5. So you get up at 4.40, you're at work by 5. Work starts at 5.10 and they close the gates to the factory at 5.10. And then you're going to you know, basically lose a day's pay if you're not there by then. Uh, work commences until breakfast at 7. They get a 30-minute breakfast break. 7.30, bell rings. They are expected to be back at their station. The machines are on, so they're not really getting 30 minutes to eat. Uh, but anyway, uh, then they have lunch at 12.30, and then that's it. At 6.30, the bell rings to go home, So they're, uh, and they presumably eat after that. So you're working from 5, 10 in the morning until 6.30 p.m. For, with a one-hour break. So that is a five-hour, I mean, sorry, 12-hour, 20-minute workday, six days a week, uh, which comes out to, uh, what is that, 75 hours a week, work week. Um, that's a lot. That's pretty, pretty crazy. But anyway, that's what they're doing. Um, and then they go, uh, they, they are going and living in dorms. And so it's very much like being in a very, very strict boarding school where instead of learning things, um, you uh, just work 12 hours a day. And yet they're still living way more freely than they would back home on the farm. They're around other young women their age and they're earning money. And they send most of that money home, but they keep some of it. Some of them keep most of it, if not all of it, right? Uh, and so this is a big dose of freedom, even though it's very constrained. And the other factories follow this. Uh, however, this was not to last because soon uh, America got a new source of labor that they could pay even less than women, and that was immigrants. So there is a massive, massive influx of immigrants in the uh, 1840s and 1850s, um, over 4 million immigrants in this short little period of time. And as you can see, most of them are coming from Ireland, with the second biggest group being Germany. This is just one year here. Um, so uh, let's talk about these uh, this growth of immigration um, 
uh, a result of this is that it really um, pushes out that factory system where you have these young girls living in dormitories. Uh, and instead, uh, these immigrants, many of them women, uh, take these jobs where they're paid even less and treated far, far worse um, and are not living under this like boarding school atmosphere. Instead, they're just working under very, very harsh, increasingly dangerous conditions uh, while being paid even less than these teenage girls have been paid um, in most cases. So let's talk about these two groups, Irish and German newcomers. So the Irish immigrants that are coming over are mostly coming due to the potato famine. Uh, the potato famine caused by a um, disease that spreads through potato crops in Ireland uh, and results in over 2 million Irish peasants starving to death in the 1840s. Um, another 2 million immigrate to America. These Irish immigrants coming to America are overwhelmingly desperately poor, illiterate, and Catholic. Also unskilled. They have no job skills. So they are going to be despised. They're going to be treated extremely harshly. I'll come back to that. Uh, the German, uh, I'm sorry, these Irish immigrants are going to mostly move to um, the New England uh, and area. So like Boston, as well as like New York City, uh, Philadelphia. So they're moving to these big cities on the northeast coast, right? Um, and uh, that's, that's them. And they're going to be working the lowest paid jobs, treated extremely harshly. You're going to see signs in New York City that say no dogs, blacks, or Irish allowed, things like that. So really bad. Uh, treated very, very similarly, if not worse, than African Americans in the North. Uh, not treated as badly as African Americans in the South, but still. Um, to be precise, I mean, they're not treated as bad as Southern African Americans. Uh, they are not moving to the South. These immigrants, very few immigrants ever go to the South because there is no economic, no, yeah, there is no economic opportunity in the South, right? The Southern economy is in a stranglehold um, of slave owners. These slave owners absolutely dominate the Southern economy. There is no possibility of competing with that. So, anyway. Um, the second group we have are German immigrants. And these German immigrants that are coming over are very different. They are uh, predominantly middle class. They are literate, at least in German, though very likely they don't speak English. Uh, and they are mostly Protestant. Um, and so they are going to face way less discrimination, um, though obviously they will still face some discrimination. Um, they're mostly going to move to the, the Northwest, to places like Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Chicago, um, Illinois, Detroit, Michigan, places like that. That's where they're mostly going to move to. Um, and, uh, and yeah, they're going to be mostly middle class um, they're either going to buy land and become farmers, or they're going to, you know, start businesses uh, and things of that nature, for the most part. Okay, so let's flip over the study guide to the next page and talk about nativism. Uh, nativism is a fancy way of saying racist against immigrants. Uh, Anti-immigrant racism or nativism goes hand in hand with immigration throughout our nation's history and, and really any country's history. But throughout American history, anytime there is a major influx of immigration, it is met with a major wave of nativism, anti-immigrant racism. This is held true throughout our entire history. Um, in the 1840s and 1850s, this nativism is focused almost 100% on the Irish and mostly revolves around their Catholicism, though it's not just Catholicism. Catholicism is just simply one aspect of what brings this nativism. Um, and this often erupted into violence. Uh, as we see here, the riot of Philadelphia, uh, what happened was the, um, the city council of Philadelphia uh, mandated that public schools must use the King James Bible as part of their instruction. Um, yes, in America, where we're supposed to have separation of church and state. Uh, the King James Bible Nothing inherently bad about it. Definitely not saying there's anything wrong with it. It has often been weaponized by nativists against Catholics, though, or by by uh, fundamentalist pro uh, Protestants against Catholics. It's been used as kind of like a, a dividing issue. 
Uh, so uh, when this happened, uh, uh, Catholic immigrants protested in front of the city hall, uh, protesting this, uh, you know, attack on their religion as they saw it. And nativists came out and attacked the protesters. And pretty soon there were armed battles in the streets between nativist immigrants and the National Guard and the police, and, or the, sorry, the state militia and the police, and 15 people were killed. Um, often what we also see is the burning of Catholic churches and other religious buildings. Um, this was sometimes more than once spurred on by ministers. Uh, the Reverend Lyman Beecher, father of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Lyman Beecher is a, a Presbyterian minister and a rabid anti-Catholic and nativist. Um, and on at least two separate occasions, he riled up a crowd, which then left his sermon and immediately went to the nearest Catholic church and burned it down, um, such as here, where uh, the Ursuline Convent in Charlestown, Massachusetts, was burned down by an angry crowd of Protestants following a sermon by Reverend Lyman Beecher. Uh, he did this again in Boston, where they burned down another convent. Interesting that they keep attacking the nuns. Hmm. But anyway, uh, so yeah, that's 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 messed up. But that is a thing. Um, moving on to a completely and utterly different topic. Uh, it, the next thing in the chapter, I don't even have a picture for it, so we'll just we'll just uh, look at this picture of uh, uh, the poet and author Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, <coughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson, and his uh, glorious uh, sideburns there, um, and uh, talk about something that has nothing to do with him, uh, but something he definitely was not a fan of. And that is the corporation. So we learned about corporations way back in chapter two, right? We talked about joint stock companies are an early version of the corporation. But a corporation is simply any business um, that has many um, investors or multiple investors. Uh, it is uh, today, legally speaking, you have to actually get like a contract for your corporation called a corporate charter or an article of corporation. Um, there's different types like an LLC, which is a limited liability corporation and so on. Uh, but essentially, this is where you're creating a legal entity as your business. Uh, this is really important, uh, and this gets us into the advantages of having a corporation. Uh, advantage number one, it's way easier to raise money this way, right? If I'm starting a business by myself and I need $100,000, I've got to get $100,000, right? But if I start a corporation and I need $100,000, if I can get 50 investors to each put in $2,000, that's 100000 It's way easier to get one person to give me $2,000 than it is to get one person to give me 100000 right? So if I can get 50 investors, I'm done. And then maybe they give me 10000 and instead of raising $100,000, I'm now ra uh, raising uh, $500,000, right? And so I can raise more money quicker. That's one advantage. Another advantage of the corporation is what we call limited liability. And that is the concept that um, a corporation is liable for the debts incurred by that company, by that corporation, right? Whereas a business owner is liable for the debts created by his business, right? So if I just want to start a restaurant and I borrow, you know, a million dollars to start my restaurant, and my restaurant goes out of business, I owe a million dollars. But if instead I start a corporation, and my corporation borrows a million dollars and then goes out of business, my corporation owes a million dollars. I don't owe anything. This is known as limited liability. Uh, this can also extend to if my corporation uh, breaks any laws, though there can be consequences for that for the people involved in the corporation, but not the owners. Again, it would be for the people operating things, the, the CEO and so on. So those are the advantages of a corporation easier to raise money, and limited liability. That brings us to our next two Supreme Court cases for the school year. So I said over the course of this year, we'll learn about 20 cases. In Chapter 8, we learned about Marbury versus Madison, which established the principle of judicial review. Here in Chapter 9, we're learning Dartmouth College versus Woodward. Dartmouth College versus Woodward. 
um, and Gibbons versus Ogden, which both have to do with corporations and with this federalist pro-big business court under John Marshall upholding the sanctity and power and um, independence of corporations and contracts. So first, Dartmouth College versus Woodward, which seems like a bit of a stretch uh, to think of it as a corporate thing. So Dartmouth College is a private university in New Hampshire. It was created before the United States. And so their charter that gives them the right to be a, a college was signed by the King of England, not by a state, but by... And uh, sorry, <laughs> my lights went off. Uh, so anyway, it was created by the King of England. And so the state of New Hampshire was like, oh, well, we want to renegotiate your charter because, you know, we're not getting any prop we're not getting any property taxes off of this thing, so we want to renegotiate your charter. Sorry about that. Okay, so anyway, they want to renegotiate the charter. Went to the Supreme Court. The, the, the college sued the Secretary of State of New Hampshire, whose last name is Woodward, so thus Dartmouth College versus Woodward. And the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the college and said, no, states cannot interfere with contracts under any circumstances. Now, in this case, that makes complete sense. And obviously, Dartmouth you know, they shouldn't get, the state shouldn't get to turn around and mess with their contract that they had already signed. Of course, makes sense. The thing about it is, is this can then open the door to corporations securing really super juicy contracts that get them out of things like taxes, right? Uh, and then future state governments become more progressive um, and want to, you know, actually start, you know, taxing corporations or regulating them, stopping them from doing various shady things or, you know, polluting or whatever, right? And the corporation can go, ah, ah, but see, we have this contract. So you can't, even though that contract might be 50 or 100 years old, right? In the case of Dartmouth College, that contract was like 70 years old at this point, uh, but it stayed and it's still in effect, right? So that is kind of the, the other, the flip side to this. Uh, next, we have Gibbons versus Ogden, another one where it's like, well, yeah, of course. Uh, so Gibbons versus Ogden, in this case, uh, you have two companies. I don't really know which one is which. Let's just pretend Gibbons is the New York company. Ogden is the New Jersey company. So what happened is uh, the cities of uh, New York City and Newark, New Jersey are separated by a river. Um, I think it's the East River, I think, but I don't actually know. Who knows what river it really is. Anyway, they're separated by a river. Uh, and, uh, of course, if today you take a plane to fly to, well, like on my honeymoon, my wife and I, uh, we went to the Caribbean, uh, to St. Martin in the Caribbean. But to get there, we flew first to New York City. So we flew to JFK International Airport in New York City. But our flight to St. Martin took off in Newark, New Jersey. So we had to take a cab which cost us like $170, by the way, uh, from JFK to Newark. And that was just a, you know, we drove on a bridge. It was a really long bridge. It was like, took forever. That's why it was $175. But anyway, the point is, uh, back then there was no bridge. It was a, a ferry, right? Um, and uh, there was just one ferry owned by the Gibbons company or by, Gib or by somebody named Gibbons, I don't know. Uh, and this ferry... They had an exclusive contract with the state of New York. They're the only ferry allowed to operate across that river. But you might see the problem here. Where are they going? They're not going to New York. They're going from New York to New Jersey, right? So then the state of New Jersey gave a contract to Ogden to also operate a ferry. And Gibbons sues Ogden saying, hey, we have a contract. You can't mess with our contract like that. And this time the Supreme Court rules against them. They rule in favor of the other company because they say, here's the deal. The state of New York cannot control what the state of New Jersey does um, business-wise, right? Which is absolutely true. Um, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution clearly states that the regulation of interstate commerce is the power of the federal government, power of Congress, right? So only Congress can regulate a business that operates across state lines. The states can't do that. Um, and thus, uh, what we're seeing here is, again, um, in the case of Gibbons or Sogden, it's like, oh, well, they're going against the contract, right? But 
actually what they're doing is they're ruling in favor of corporations being able to get deals within their own states, um, regardless of what another state says. So in both these cases, we're seeing a pro-business court, which makes sense because the Federalists are pro-business. Right? These are the federal. This is the party of Hamilton, right? So that is Gibbons versus Ogden. All right, moving on. Uh, the next topic on your study guide, I don't really feel like talking about very much. John L. Sol uh, John L. O'Sullivan and Manifest Destiny. That's something you've learned about before back in Chapter 8. Um, what I'll just briefly say is John uh, O'Sullivan uh, coined this term, Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny, he said it was our manifest destiny. Um, manifest means made visible, made obvious, made physical, right? Destiny, obviously, you know, destiny, right? Uh, what is fated to happen. And he was saying, essentially, it is clear, it is manifest, that God, the Christian God, the Protestant Christian God, wants us, white Americans, to spread across North America. That is our plan, that is his plan for us to do this. That is what manifest destiny means. Uh, what it amounts to is that the United States is going to have an excuse for removing Indians from their land, often through genocide, uh, and taking that land and settling it with mostly white settlers. Um, and it's going to have an, uh, a justification for um, going to war with Mexico and taking literally half of their country. Uh, and later, it's kind of a justification for overthrowing the uh, monarchy of Hawaii and instituting a essentially uh, fascist military government uh, there, uh, and and so on, and so on, and so on. Manifest Destiny is going to be an excuse for all that. So you guys have obviously heard about that before. Um, the next topic on the study guide is the myth of the West. Uh, the idea here is the Wild West, right? We have this idea in our heads, this mythos about the West, right? That is this wild frontier of rugged individualism, and the author essentially is saying, well, not really, right? Um, so first of all, um, the West comes to symbolize this, but the truth of the matter is the West is going to be heavily dependent on government help, right? The federal government is going to build railroads to help settle the West. The federal government is going to use the military to wipe out, murder, or remove, or move Native Americans from their land. The federal government is going to spend money on irrigation projects to make the West farmable, and so on. Uh, the, West, the, the federal government is going to give away land for free in the West. And so while the West has this mythos around it of being a land of rugged individualism, the truth is people moving to the West are highly dependent on the federal government. On top of that, uh, and he really gets more into this in chapter 16, next, which we'll cover next semester in January. But on top of that, um, by the time people, by like the 1870s, uh, the West, Western land is mostly owned by a handful of major corporations. And uh, these independent farmers are mostly renting land from these big corporations. Or if they're living on their own land, they're selling their produce to these big corporations who kind of control what they grow and all that. So it's actually not quite as uh, rugged and individualistic as the Western mythos makes it out to be. All right. And so now that brings us to transcendentalism. And I would like to save that for next week. So I just want to leave you with a, a little uh, reminder here. I will be back tomorrow. Um, you know, I was out today because my wife's uncle died of COVID two days ago, and I just wanted to be there for her as she's grieving. But uh, plan is to come back to work tomorrow, um, and we're going to do our Socratic seminar over Arnaia Woman Chapter 2. So tonight, if you've not read ch Chapter 2 of Arnaia Woman, please, please do. Um, it will really help us to have a better class discussion if you can actually be an active part of that. Uh, remember to go into Canvas and do the assignment, uh, Aren't I a Woman Report number two. Make sure you actually read the assignment thoroughly and actually follow those directions because I want everyone to get 100 on that. 
Um, and uh, please email me if you have any questions uh, or concerns about anything. Um, you know I'm always here for you. Uh, and uh, I miss you guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a good day. Bye-bye.